Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's class on uh, graphite drawing pencil basics. I'm your instructor, Adrian Hodge, and this class uses all supplies that you can purchase at Michael's, uh, either in store or online, um, or you can use whatever you have around the house that uh, you know will go along with what we're covering in the class. So um, this is a uh, repeat a bit of some uh, a, a class topic that was the very first class topic that we ever covered or that I ever covered when uh, hosting these classes for Michaels back in July of uh, 2021. So we're <clears throat> uh, over two years out here and I'm revisiting this topic along with some other topics that I covered in those early classes. Um, mostly because uh, the questions about these topics come up quite a bit. I end up kind of doing little side lessons and repeating the stuff um, from those early classes and just to kind of refresh it in a new way. Um, another exciting thing about tonight's class is that it is the first in our new uh, time format. We're going to be uh, in the class for 90 minutes um, instead of 60 minutes. So uh, the class uh, was possibly listed as uh, 60 minutes, as you noticed, but it is 90 minutes in length. So if you can't attend the whole thing, just stick around for as long as you can. You can always record, uh, watch the full recording later on YouTube. And um, but yeah, we're going to be able to like really take our, our time. And we uh, so if you've been with me for a while, I usually will do a one hour class uh, weekly at the same time, Wednesdays at 6 p.m., um, but from now on going forward, they're going to be, uh, three classes a month on Wednesdays and they'll be 90 minutes in length. So yeah, I see a lot of great comments in, in the chat, appreciating the longer classes. So yeah, we'll have a little bit more time to, uh, slow down and answer questions at the end. I used to do a little Q and A on, um, on Instagram afterwards to like answer lingering questions, but you know, with this new format now, I'm going to, that's going to be built in a little bit more. So ask as many questions as you want. Um, all right. So I am going to switch to my tabletop view and go over the supplies here and we'll get started. Uh, don't forget to tag your work if you make anything from tonight's class uh, that you share online with uh, those hashtags, make it with Michaels or Michaels classes. And you can follow me on Instagram at Adrian Hodge Art. Um, you can also follow me on Facebook, uh, Adrian Hodge Fine Art. And you can find some of my artwork there on Instagram or on my website if you poke around there on on those links okay uh so really any set of graphite pencils that you have tonight will work fine um you know this class is very comprehensive so um i or i wanted it to be very comprehensive so i purchased a couple of different sets of uh pencils in the the windsor and mutant brand so they come in this fun little tin um, and that's what I, I put on the supply list. But then I believe I added a note about how, you know, any graphite pencils that you have on hand will uh, be fine to use tonight. So I just wanted to make sure that I had like a very full range of all possibilities. Um, these go from a 4H to a 9B. Um, and they, there are 10 B pencils out there. You might have a 10 B it's just going to be, you know, one higher than the nine B. Okay. So what are we going to cover tonight? We're going to cover, um, what these numbers and letters on the pencils mean, um, the H and the B's and the, are the letters and, and F's. And then, uh, we will cover, you know, what the numbers mean, the, that whole spectrum. And then we're also going to cover a little bit of uh, basics regarding creating a value scale, and then also how to uh, use value to turn a two-dimensional form like a circle into uh, a three-dimensional form like a sphere here. So I've got a little sketch here, and we're going to draw this from our imaginations. We're not going to look at an actual um, sphere 
for this. So I've just got like some little imaginary light and I drew a little cloud over here because I was trying to be cute. Okay, so we're gonna talk about how to hold the pencils for optimal um, you know, drawing results. And we're gonna talk about, you know, just kind of some pitfalls that a lot of people fall into when they don't understand these numbers and letters on the graphite pencils. And then we'll do a little drawing with the value scale and uh, talking about, you know, tonal shading only tonal value, but I'll also, uh, you know, reference some other classes that you can look at if you want to know a little bit more about value shading techniques other than that tonal shading. So I'm gonna rip this page out of my sketchbook real quick here so I can have it to easily refer back to. And then I'm just gonna flip to a blank page um, but before I do that, I should mention the classes that are coming up in uh, the next couple of weeks because those are also hour and a half long classes. So we've got, uh, I think the next one is actually not this one. Hang on. The next one is this class. It's on implied line. So we're going to be doing some timed drawings of three objects. So I've got a feather, a... Um, what was it? It was a feather and, oh yeah, some roses, some dried roses, and then a photograph of a Luna moss. And so we're gonna be looking at those three photographs that I included in that class. We're gonna be doing a series of timed drawings. So just for example, we're gonna draw the feather in 12 minutes, and then we're gonna draw the feather in seven minutes, and then four minutes, and then two minutes, and then one minute. And the idea is that by drawing the same object using less and less time, that you will start to understand what is meant by implied line. So implying a form based on these kind of connect the dot lines. Um, so that's what's coming up next week. And that'll be an hour and a half long class as well, all about implied line. And it is not about speed. It is about uh, the, it's not meant, those exercises with time are not meant to um, glorify speed drawing in any way. It's just a device for getting you to understand implied line. And then the class that's coming up in two weeks is going to be using blind contour line drawings to understand line weight. So the kind of variation between thickness and thinness in a line. Um, and I see that Chanel just dropped the links to both of those classes in the chat. And if you're watching this later on YouTube, you can just search um, on the Michaels website under online classes that are coming up and uh, you'll find those classes on um, implied line and then line weight that are coming up over the next couple of weeks. Okay, so let's get into it with these uh, graphite drawing pencils. So the first thing I want you to do is just take any H pencil that you have in your, your set here. So I'm just gonna take the one that's just labeled H and it does not matter which one that you grab. And then I want you to grab the B pencil, any B pencil, doesn't matter which one, um, but I just happened to grab the the regular H and the B. And then I just want us to like draw a line with each one. And also we're gonna be fighting against the light in Zoom tonight because it does not like to show my light lines. And sometimes turning off my light actually helps you to see my lines on Zoom a little better. Okay, so I just drew a line with the H pencil and I drew a line with uh, the B pencil. So, and I used the front of the, the pencil there, so the tip of the pencil. And then I'm gonna take the side of the pencil, so the H pencil, and use the side of it and make a little scribble with it. And then do the same thing with the B pencil, use the side of the pencil and do a little scribble. So just notice the kind of thickness and thinness of lines that you can get. So I kind of made a little exclamation point there with both of them. Okay, so the H pencil stands for uh, hard. The H stands for hard. 
and the B stands for black. So it's hard and black. That's what the H and the B stands for. Uh, why they are not hard and soft, I don't understand, but I like to think about um, the word butter. So B stands for butter because butter is soft. So that can help you remember that it's hard and soft. Um, okay, so the H pencils are really great for drawing lighter lines. So they're hard, that they're gonna be good for drawing uh, lighter lines for, um, you know, kind of your early sketches, like the early lines in a sketch, your foundational lines. Here, let me actually write this with my B pencil so it'll show up a little better. Hey, Adrian. Yeah. Um, for some reason, the image is showing a little blurry. Oh, interesting. It's not showing. Yeah, it's not normally blurry. like that. Huh. Yeah, it's not looking blurry on my screen either. I saw somebody say that in the chat and I thought maybe it was just for them, but now you're saying it too, so. It's, uh, like, it's like, honestly, it's mostly on like one side where you put butter. That's kind of blurry, but the rest doesn't really look that blurry to me. Okay. Um, here, give me one second. I'm wondering if maybe I accidentally... <sighs> I put lotion on my hands before I, and then I like moved the camera a little bit. So I'm wondering if maybe I just like rubbed it with my. That could be it. <laughs> See if maybe I just need to clean my lens a little bit. Um, I do have a backup lens I could grab if this is still looking blurry after I just did that. I also have a glasses cleaning kit I could try. Is that still looking blurry to you? Uh, that looks better to me. Okay. Maybe I could get a little closer to the page too. Since we are. Oh, I feel like this is so terrible. I hope I'm not making anybody dizzy. Does that look better? You know what? Um, maybe I will just write it. Maybe it's just that it's having a hard time picking up the, um, because of just the light, does that still look blurry? I, I think the, I think closer is making it a little worse. Oh, geez, okay. Wow, is that better? Yeah, that looks better. Okay, maybe it's just that it's fighting to pick up the lines with the pencils. This is gonna be a struggle since this is all about the pencils tonight, but maybe let me, let me write it in pen. Okay, so we've got our H stands for hard and we've got our B stands for black. Um, and so the H pencils are gonna be good for our lighter foundational lines. In a drawing and our B pencils are going to be the best for our uh, value, for our shading. And, uh, you know, maybe more details, contrast. And, well, mostly our, our darker values. And then our lighter values we'll use the H pencils. Okay, so is that looking good? Does that look blurry still? Um, it does look better, but it I don't know. It's on the right side. It's just a little blurrier for some reason. That is so weird. Um, it's not looking too bad for me, but I can kind of see it a little bit. Um, Geez, I, I hate to do this, but I do have a backup lens. Let me switch to my backup lens. I guess it's good that we have the extra time. Let me um 
Let me switch back to my forward facing view for just one moment here. Um, well, I can just talk uh, and say what I was gonna have y'all do while I switch my lens here. So um, I have this little spiel, like has this ever happened to you? You're drawing with your, with your pencil and you make a mark on your page that you don't intend to be there. I don't, I don't like to use the word mistake because I like to think mistakes are opportunities for growth and discovery and they're not necessarily, you know, this terrible bad thing. So I like to say unintentional marks and you try to erase it and it won't go away. It's just like completely embedded in the paper. So I'm willing to bet everybody's nodding their heads and saying, yes, that has happened to me. So, and then if you, you know, were able to erase it, maybe you go to shade later with a uh, darker pencil. And now your darker pencil has like rubbed over that indention that you made in the paper. And it creates these like ghost lines that then haunt you in your drawing. So I'm willing to bet everybody's nodding their heads and that has also happened to them. How's that look? Like now it looks a little blurry on the other side. I don't know what. Yeah, that is weird. It's going to be fine. As long as, as long as you can read, you know, you're, you're hearing my words, you're able to read it. Like, I mean, I'm just writing a few notes here. We're going to get into the drawing aspect in just a bit. And I think you're going to be able to see enough. I don't know what's going on tonight, but yeah, I think it's fine. I'm just going to work with it and move forward. Um, so um, I see somebody just asked, what is HB? So <laughs> those are the letters that come on the side of the pencil. So if you look at your graphite pencils they've got letters and numbers printed on the side of them um, and they have h and they have b and then they have numbers so right now we're just talking about what those uh, letters stand for they stand for hard and black um, but i like to say that the b stands for butter because it's soft so it's a softer uh, graphite so what's happening within the pencil itself is that it actually has uh, more graphite in it. So there's more graphite in the pencil and there's less uh, binders. So less like, you know, wax or whatever additives are added uh, to the pencil to like, you know, make it into a pencil right inside of the the wood casing here. So like the actual pencil itself just has more graphite and less binders. And on the H side, you've got less graphite and more binders. <clears throat> so just like paint has binders, like, you know, linseed oil or uh, gum Arabic or, or whatever, wax or whatever is added to the pencil, um, there's more of it in an H pencil, more binder and uh, less graphite. Okay, so what does this mean and why is it important? So that's what I was saying. Has this ever happened to you? You're drawing with the H pencil and you make a mark and you tr go to erase it and you can't. And I'm sure a lot of you were nodding your heads and saying, yes, that happens. Okay, so let's figure out what's happening when that occurs and how we can prevent it. So uh, we're gonna just exaggerate here. And um, I always like to say, it's almost as if we've all been using a trombone our entire lives for utilitarian purpose. And then now we're being tasked to make music with that trombone and we are simply holding it incorrectly because we've been using it for this utilitarian purpose. And the utilitarian purpose is writing, right? We learned how to write with a writing pencil or maybe a number two pencil in, uh, you know, preschool, grade school, whatever. And then um, our dexterity, what we were able to do as children was just like grip the pencil as tightly as we could and have it perpendicular to the paper. So the paper's flat and our hand is going straight up and down on the paper, the pencil's perpendicular, right? Um, and then, so we're gripping it we're pressing down really hard. We're doing all those things 
that we were only able to do as children in order to be able to control our movements. But when we're drawing, that is not necessarily the most helpful way to uh, to hold a pencil. And that's why you end up, you know, pressing down. And if we're using a pencil that has more wax and binders in it, it's almost as if this pencil was created with a specific use in mind and that's not it, okay? So what we're gonna exaggerate for a second here and we're gonna just hold the pencil uh, every way I just said, straight up and down. So it's like going straight into the camera, right? Straight up and down to the paper. I want you to grip it towards the end of the pencil, hold it really tight. And just for exaggeration purposes with that H pencil, so any H that you have, in your hand, um, just like carve your name into the paper here. Also, I jump, we have such so few supplies on this uh, list, but you're you're definitely gonna want an eraser in addition to your sketchbook and your, your pencils tonight. Um, so we're just carving our name. So I carved my nickname there. And then now I'm gonna try to erase that and it's not going away, right? Like I said, this is not the intended use of this pencil. This H pencil, these were not created to drive you nuts and to make your life miserable when you're drawing. They were created to be able to make nice light lines that are easy to erase. Okay, so what's the opposite of everything we just did, the way we just held the pencil? Let me see it in the chat. What, what would be the opposite? And I'll answer that question in just a minute, Emily, about what the F stands for. Um, but can someone drop in the chat and tell me? Um, okay, so Brittany said, hold it further back. Uh, Susmitha says, hold it sideways. Tina says, slant hold. Not Don't hold it perpendicular, Leslie says. Uh, loose angled. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, no pressure. Yeah, Tim said loose angled. Tanya said no pressure. Inez angled. Yeah, all right, y'all are getting it parallel to the paper. So if this is perpendicular, this is parallel, right? Two lines that do not intersect, or it can be a little angled. And then I want you to hold it towards the back. And if that feels weird, then maybe you just come like a little bit, just back off the front of it, you know, just back off a little, come back as far back as you can comfortably hold it. It's a muscle memory thing. So it's going to take some time to get used to if you've never held your pencil like that, if you're always gripping it super tight. Um, someone said, hold it like a soup spoon like that. <laughs> that can be helpful sometimes, um, but that might feel, you know, that might be a, a little strange for some people, but yes, holding it like a soup spoon can be um, can be very, very helpful to, to do what we're, we're trying to do. I really appreciate that one. Um, but for those of us who are like really beginner minded here, let's try just like, coming back a little further like that or hold it towards the the back um and then uh less pressure okay so we're going to put very little pressure on uh the pencil and i want you to just sign your name so now i'm like doing cursive because it just makes me want to be lighter so i don't expect you're going to see my lines y'all are going to have to just believe me that i signed my name there um, and then I want you to do the same, holding it towards the back or yeah, if you want to hold it like a soup spoon, more cradled like this, you know, however you hold your soup spoon, do it, do what feels right to you. Just hold it towards the back, less pressure and more on its side. And then when we go to erase that, guess what? It's going completely away. It's like, it was never there. It's almost as if that's how these pencils were meant to be used so that they don't drive us nuts, right? Um, so yeah, that's a really frustrating way to draw. If you're always, you know, indenting your paper with every line that you make, especially with these H pencils that are that are hard and stiff and, you know, full of wax and everything, then, you know, yeah, you're creating a, a lot more issues for yourself than you don't really need. Um, so I always like to say, like, let's try to draw a circle. I'll do it with my pen. Let me try to draw a, a perfect circle the first time. Didn't quite do it. Pretty okay, but not a perfect circle. But if I take my H pencil and I just kind of do that thing where I hold it towards the back and I swirl it around, 
and I keep kind of searching for that nice circular shape and I'm just letting all my lines kind of sit on the surface of the paper in a, you know, that baby's breath kind of way, then I see the perfect circle in there. And then now all I got to do is take my B pencil, my darker pencil, and do the same thing. Go nice and light. Let it sit on the surface of the paper as well. And just, you know, maybe use a little more pressure and start to find that circular shape. And now I've done it. So using the H pencil for those foundational lines and letting it be nice and light and sit on the surface of the paper is gonna make a world of difference. Um, there's one other thing I wanna say regarding holding the pencil and that is um, I want you to try to lock your wrist so your the movement is not coming from your hand. Uh, the movement is coming from your arm as you're doing that. So as you're trying to find that circular shape, you're moving your entire arm and finding a circle so that, um, you know, you've just got more control that way. And that seems counterintuitive. It seems like you would have, you know, more control this way. Uh, but think about like a wireless mouse. Like if I'm using my mouse on my laptop right here and I'm using just the space uh, provided on the, the computer, I'm only using my hand. I don't have quite as much control. If I were to use a wireless mouse, then I have a lot more control over where I can point the mouse on the computer. Um, someone else used a golf analogy in a class recently, a private lesson student of mine said, um, I don't play golf, but something about like a power swing. Maybe it was a baseball thing, but that like the further back you hold it, I can't remember. I want to say it was baseball, but then I repeated that and someone was like, I think that's golf. Y'all can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not a sports person, but uh, the idea being that if you want to get a tight shot, you hold it further up or back on the, you know, the the bat or the the club, depending on where that, that analogy I'm trying to search for, but that if you get back on it, you can like swing it and like get like more power to happen. So that makes sense. Uh, anyway, okay, so more the control is coming from the arm, um, not uh, from your wrist. And that's something that nobody ever taught me um, when I was learning how to draw, it was really something that I learned over time, like, oh, hey, I'm getting more control and I can do a lot more when I hold, you know, my pencil towards the back and the movement is coming from my entire arm and not my wrist. So try to lock your wrist when you're finding those big shapes, especially, and uh, use the the movement of your, your arm and your bicep and not so much, you know, trying to force it with your wrist because the dexterity is it's really an entire arm movement. Um, and then for, you know, smaller details, then yeah, maybe you get in there and the movement is coming more from your wrist. Um, okay, so uh, Leslie's asking about the lower number B and what does that mean versus higher? I'm getting to it. Y'all are like way ahead of me. I feel like I, maybe I need to stop looking at the chat. Y'all are asking questions. I'm like, that's where I'm headed. <laughs> We've got an hour and a half. So I'm trying to take the long way around the block. Um, okay, so let's talk about those numbers on the pencil. So um, we've talked about how the uh, the H is hard and the, the B is uh, black or soft, more like butter. So as those numbers are uh, happening, so let's say we've got a lower number excuse me, um, as the numbers are getting higher the on the H side, that means our pencils are getting uh, lighter. So as the number goes higher, they're getting lighter. Um, they're having less graphite and more binders. So as the number goes higher, that's when they're getting lighter harder, lighter and harder. 
Okay, and then as the numbers go higher on the B side, as those numbers go up, um, they are getting, you guessed it, darker, softer, more like butter. So more graphite, less binders. More like butter. And then the F pencil stands for fine. And it falls right about here on this spectrum. So we've got uh, our lightest pencil in these two sets that I have would be the 4H. Uh, and then we've got the 3H, the 2H. We're going to make the spectrum together here, y'all. And then we've got the H just by itself. No, no number on it. That would be like a 1H, I guess, if you had to put a, a number on it or more like a 0H. And then you've got the F, which is somewhere in between an, uh, you know, an H and an HB. An HB is a number two pencil. So you've maybe noticed that a number two pencil says HB on it sometimes. Okay, so here's these for your notes. And then as we're going higher on the uh, B side, We've got, you know, the B and then the 2B, the 3B, the 4B, the 5B, 6B, 7B, 8B, and then I've got a 9B here in this set. Okay, so how are we doing on time? We're at uh, half an hour in. We're going to go ahead and make a little value scale uh, like this or make a, a little scale. So I'm not going to draw it with a ruler this time. I'm just going to use my arm movement and try to get a nice straight line to happen using the side of my pencil. And yeah, I'm just gonna make a less perfect looking uh, scale here for the pencils. And I on the last one, I used all of those pencils to make it so that you could kind of see, like I sketched the line itself with the 4H and I am seeing the blurriness now as I look at those. That's so strange. I don't know what's going on. Maybe it is just that the light is struggling to capture these these light lines with the H pencils. Um, I don't usually have a lot of writing in these classes, um, but that says 4H, that says 3H, 2H, um, H, F and so I used those actual pencils here just to make the lighter marks and then HB, B, 2B, 3B, 4B, 5B, 6B, 7B, 8B, 9B. So I'm just going to do that again. But so I've got the 4H, the 2H, So if you want to do this with me, we'll have a nice little spectrum here showing where all of these pencils fall. Oh, I skipped 3B. Not every set is going to have, you know, things like a 3B. They tend to go in terms of twos. Like 2B, 4B, 6B, etc. I bought this Windsor and Newton set specifically because it had so many and we could get such a full spectrum going here. Okay, so let's take all of the pencils that you have and just get them out in your, you know, easily accessible here. Um, and I'm just going to go down the line and we're going to make a little value scale. So we're going to make a value scale from zero to 10. Um, and let's sketch a little rectangle first to help ourselves. I kind of just sketched it floating there by itself before. So let's sketch a long skinny rectangle and we're just going to make a tonal value shading scale from zero to 10 using our graphite pencils here. So a nice long skinny rectangle 
and we'll label it with a zero and a 10. And this is our tonal value scale. We had a class at the very beginning of this series um, on tonal value with and without a ground was the name of it. And Chanel um, can drop that link to that class in the, the chat for you if you wanna check that one out um, or watch it later on YouTube where I just talked all about uh, tonal shading of a, a lemon using a uh, ground and without a ground. So a ground is just basically laying down a layer of tonal value first and then erasing out highlights and then without a ground is just shading it in without doing that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm just gonna take the lightest pencil that I have, which is a 4H. And first I wanna leave, leave some blank paper down here on the end by the zero. So the zero is our blank paper or our absolute highlight. So if we were painting, it might be our absolute white paint with no pigment or color coming into it our absolute highlight, and then our 10 is our absolute black. So no paper peeking through our absolute black. Okay, so we're gonna use our 4H and we're gonna use it on the side of the pencil. And we're just gonna sketch in just like a baby's breath here of some value that's gonna be really hard to see on the screen. And then let's just slowly go up our scale here. So I started with a 4H. You start with whatever your lightest is on this spectrum. And each time we're just going to get progressively darker. And I'm going the opposite of how I usually go. Usually I go on the dark side and then I lighten up on my pressure. Um, but I like to switch it up because there's not just one way to draw. It's whatever feels right to you. And right now it feels right to start on the lighter side. Um, people are always asking me, do you do this or do you do that? As if it's like an either or, and there's like a right and a wrong way to do everything when it comes to art moving. And I usually will give people a very frustrating answer <laughs> to that question because it's up to you. I don't know. Do you want to start with your light pencil or do you want to start with your dark pencil? Because sometimes I do both. Um, so you might do a 2H right here. I'm going to go ahead and jump to the H pencil and then I'll get the F in there. We can always go back and make things a little darker too if we need to kind of blend them out. So now I've got the F. So I'm looking for like a medium gray by the time I get to the middle here. So I might want to go back um, like now that I've got, I'm at the F, it's starting to get a little darker, but here's something that I like to do to help with blending. I'm going to go back to my lightest pencil now and I'm going to start where I got darker and I'm just going to put a little more pressure and then I'm gonna gradually let up on that pressure as I pull down. And that's gonna like easily blend it out a little bit there, but I'm still using the side, not the, the tip of these lighter pencils. All right, and then my HB is a good one to start to get more for this mid-tone here, more of like a five on the value scale, but a B is also good to get that mid-tone. So you can start to blend those however you want. Maybe go back to the lighter one and, and blend it out. This doesn't have to be perfect, by the way. We're just getting an understanding of how we can make uh, tonal value happen. So tone is like, you know, in music, it's a smooth, continuous thing. So we're looking for this kind of smooth, continuous, blended uh, thing to happen here. All right, so that was my HB. Now I've got my B pencil. 
And I'm still using the side. I'm keeping it nice and smooth and tonal. I'm still not putting that much pressure with the, the B pencil. I can always go back and you know press down a little harder at any point. And then now the 2B. And actually, I might jump from the 2B now to my darkest dark and then kind of let them meet in the middle here. So I'm going to jump to the darkest pencil I have, which is that 9B. And I'm going to try to get to an absolute black with the 9B. So that way I can kind of see where I need to, you know, go with my pressure between the 10 and the 5 that I made there. So I'm still keeping it nice and smooth and even amount of pressure so that, you know, it feels just soft and continuous, but I don't want any light coming into this. So I can kind of start to let up on my pressure. And then now my nine will be almost as black as the 10, but there's a little bit of light coming into it. And then I'll switch to my 8B and then my 7B, etc. And do that same thing. So that would be 8B. This is the 7B. I feel like I don't have it like fully blended yet, but I can always go back in. And honestly, you can get, you know, a full value scale to happen with just like one or two of these pencils. You don't need to use them all. I'm mostly just doing it for the sake of our, our subject matter here tonight. So like I can take this 6B and take it up there and get the, the blend to happen from the, you know, darkest dark to this medium dark because I need to lighten up quite a bit between here and there. All right, so yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect. We're just looking for, you know, an understanding of how to get this smooth, continuous value scale to happen of tonal shading from absolute black to absolute white highlight and then get, you know, <clears throat> this kind of blended value in between to happen. Okay. So now let's talk about that uh, tonal value in regards to creating a uh, three-dimensional form from a two-dimensional shape. So I feel like I kind of rushed through some of that stuff at the beginning and then now I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm on the last step of this and we have 45 minutes. I meant to take my time, but y'all asked me so many questions so quickly, I kind of rushed through it. It's a new format slowing down like this, so let me stretch it out. We might we might talk about some other shading techniques to, to fill the time here because it looks like we're gonna we're gonna have some extra time now with all this extra time added on. But yeah, feel free to ask any other questions. I feel like everybody's gotten super quiet now. Um, okay, so now we want to turn a two-dimensional shape into a three-dimensional form using our tonal value. So yeah, let's, uh, let's do this a few different ways. So I'm going to add on the other shading techniques since we have uh, so much time here. So 
Um, grab. Oh, you know what? It's at the front of the sketchbook. We'll talk about those other shading techniques real quick. So we reviewed them recently in a class on um, pen and ink shading techniques. So we created these value scales using um, hatching, cross-hatching, stippling, and scribbling. So uh, I'll just review really quickly here. Even though this is pen, you can do all of these with a pencil. The only one um, that you can't do in a pen is the tonal shading because you need to be able to get that smooth, you know, continuous thing to happen. So you have to have charcoal or graphite or something nice and soft to get tonal value to happen. Um, but with a pen, you have to do one mark at a time. So we've got hatching, cross hatching, stippling, and scribbling. Hatching to get to that uh, full, you know, 10 on the value scale. Okay, I gotta flip that over. Uh, you're using one line at a time, one mark at a time. And then you're using less pressure on the pen, spacing those out um, to, to get the lighter values to happen. And then the cross hatching, you're using multiple directional lines and you're spacing out your lines using less pressure uh, on the pen or the pencil. You can do these in pencil as well. Stippling is one dot at a time. So you're just doing these, you know, really focused little dots and you overlap those until you get to a solid black on the value scale, and then you're spacing them out, uh, you know, less pressure on the pen, et cetera, to get the lighter values or the pencil, less pressure on whatever you're drawing with. And then uh, scribbling or random mark, it's just like it sounds, you're scribbling and you're filling in those value shapes based on you know whatever value you're seeing there and you're filling it in with a scribble or a random mark. So I did some kind of square scribbles or you could use like the letter E over and over again. Um, so it can be kind of random. And that was the class that we, we dropped into the, the chat earlier if you wanted to check that out um, on those other value shading techniques. But we're gonna primarily focus on the, the tonal uh, shading here, but just since we have the extra time and we got through everything else so quickly, um, I'm gonna have us draw instead of just one circle, let's draw uh, five circles. That way we'll we'll be sure to get um, a lot of practice here and go to the end of the hour and we'll do the tonal shading uh, circle first. That way we finish that one and then we'll just have all those other ones just be a bonus. Since, since we got through things a little faster than I intended to. Okay, so I'm taking my H pencil and I am sketching one circle to start. We'll take our time with the, the tonal shading and then we'll move on to those other ones. So you might not be able to see my lines yet and that's okay. I'm gonna darken them up in just a moment when I start to add more value. So I'm just using that arm movement to find my really nice circle shape. It might not be perfect right away, but eventually I'm gonna find something that feels like a pretty perfect circle. Okay. And then once I do, I want you to think about the uh, light source coming from, I'm looking for my dark pencil, my 9D or something here. Okay, so we're gonna draw a little sun over here in the top left. So this is our sun emitting light, right? And it's hitting the, the circle in the top left. And then the, so that means the shadow is gonna be falling over here to the bottom right. So we're just gonna sketch a circle from our imagination. Actually, I'm gonna have it. 
I've been falling more at an angle, like my other example here. So have the shadow falling at a, you know, at a diagonal angle from where we put the sun. So just imagining our shadow is coming down like this, okay? And then <clears throat> we're thinking about the uh, contours of this form and that other class that I dropped in the, the chat about um, the value shading techniques, it also covers contour lines. So if you're unfamiliar with those, you can check out that class. Um, and the very first class that we ever covered in this series was covered all the things we're covering tonight and also uh, contour lines, but we're just covering more of the, the value of it right now. But basically it's the idea that on a curved surface, like a circle, all of your lines are gonna be curved. There's not gonna be any straight lines. So think about like the letter C. I'm just gonna draw a little letter C up here at the top. So a C curve is like curving all the way around. And if the light is hitting it up here in the top left, then our C curve is going all the way around on the opposite side here. So see how I've kind of just created a letter C, like a backward C wrapping around my circle here. And my circle shape maybe does not look perfect right now, but I can kind of clean it up as I'm adding the value. Okay, so that's a 6B. Let me go with my darkest pencil for the darkest shadow here. Looking for, well, my 8B will work. Okay, so whatever your dark darkest pencil is. If your darkest pencil is a 6B, then use that one. But if you happen to have an 8B, um, then use that one or a 9B like I do. Um, all right. So we're just following this curve all the way around. And we're starting to add our value here in a way that follows this C curve. And I'm using the side of my pencil and I'm keeping it nice and smooth and blended. And so I'm ending up with, you know, this kind of crescent moon shape so far with my value. And I'm really keeping it nice and like my movements are kind of circular to keep it nice and soft. And like everything that I'm doing is following the C curve so far. And I'm starting to, yeah excuse me, let up on my pressure just a little bit here, even though I still want this to get pretty dark. So I'm thinking about where the light's hitting it. So you can switch to a lighter pencil as you go. So like maybe start to add some with like your 7B or your 6B if you were using the 8B or switch to your 4B you know, just start to get lighter and lighter as you move up into this, the shadow or the, the lighter part of the shadow. And actually, before we go too light, let's go ahead and with that darker pencil that you had, so like the 8B, let's put the, the shadow itself in there. So the shadow is falling on a flat surface probably, so we want our shadow, you know, to feel kind of flat. So we can put that in following kind of like a diagonal line. So you can almost do like a straight line across. And I'm leaving just a little bit of a gap there at the edge because sometimes reflective light can show up. So we can even label that like reflective light. And show up between the object and the shadow. And then you've got your highlight is what's going up here.
right here in the middle, we're looking for a mid-tone. And then a shadow of the form, and then the cast shadow of the form. Okay, so these are kind of the, the main parts here of our sphere that we're creating. So in our cast shadow, we're keeping it nice and flat, flat lines, and we're keeping it pretty much the same value throughout the shadow, although maybe it would be a little lighter here. And this is one of those things that it's fine to do from your imagination, but if you want to get a better understanding of how light, you know, is being affected on a form, look at a still life object. So that class on tonal shading with and without a ground, that's covering all of this using a lemon. So you can refer back to that. And I may repeat some of, uh, you know, classes like that going forward as well. I'm trying to work in a lot of painting classes in the new year, and we've got a lot of exciting other stuff coming up in January as well that I'll, I'll wait to talk about in the, the coming weeks. But anyway, just wanted to revisit this, uh, this core skill tonight. Okay, so back to our, our shadow on our form so we're trying to get to that mid-tone which is going to be more of like the the middle of our value scale here and then by the time we get to the highlight we want to get a little lighter and then we want to get like uh the like the uh the main highlight we want that to be blank paper or like a zero right there where the light would be hitting it more directly and we want it to feel nice and round right there so you might think about a uh, olive, you know, like a pimento olive that might have like a circle up here at the top and maybe draw your little pimento circle right there. And that's where the highlight's going. And you are going to get like some shadow, like a light shadow happening here on the edge. That's just what tends to happen on a, a spherical form like this. And yeah, there are like, you can buy styrofoam, you know, spheres to really observe this nice and well. You could also sketch an egg. Um, that's a nice object to look at. I mean, it's not going to be spherical. It's going to be egg shaped. But if you just photograph an egg or put an egg under a lamplight and then just draw the egg, you're going to see a similar situation, right? Because the egg is white or a styrofoam uh, circle would be the same because it's it's white. So it's really easy to see, you know, how light things would get. But if you're using, you know, a piece of fruit or something, obviously you're going to have the, the color of the fruit right? might get in there and might confuse things a bit for you. So I'm jumping back and forth between my light and my dark here, and you are welcome to approach this however you see fit. Like I said, there's no right or wrong way or, you know, approach or process that is better or worse. It's just what feels best to you. Uh, but I am just keeping my, I'm using the side of my pencil the whole time. You can tell it's parallel to the paper. You can't see my fingers because I'm holding the pencil towards the back. And putting very little pressure. So everything I'm doing is kind of sitting on the surface. And yeah, my lighter lines are not showing up on the zoom, but I am getting in there in following that C curve all the way around. Something that tends to happen for a lot of people the first time they do this exercise, uh, trying to make a you know flat shape feel like a <coughs> spherical form is they sometimes, it will still look flat. Like it may be looking sort of like a tunnel. 
to you. <laughs> and I'm willing to bet if you are drawing something that feels more like a tunnel with, you know, light at the end of that tunnel and it's not looking like a round sphere, then you need to be curving those lines more. So really like thinking about that letter C curve or that crescent moon all the way around. And that class on the contour lines of that lime may really help um, because it's not just the one directional. Like if I keep them one directional right here, it does start to feel kind of like a tunnel of light. But if I think about the, uh, you know, that curve on all of the sides, how it's it's curving in all directions, then it starts to feel a little more rounded. So really try to get your your value to follow a curve like over the whole thing. Think about how your pencil would be moving across, you know, the top of a ball. Does anybody want to hold up their drawings so far and show me how your spheres are coming along? I'd love to see how your process is going. Also, we're an hour in now, so this is where I usually have people hold up their drawings anyway, so seems like a good moment to do that. And I'm still working on mine, so if it's looking blurry, it's because I still got a lot of value I need to add. Um, okay, that's Barbara's sphere so far. It's looking good. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, just keep that like soft curve, that C curve going all the way around. Anybody else want to share? Ooh, look at that. That's looking nice and spherical so far. Yeah, I see that crescent moon shape going all the way around. Ooh, look at that. I love a good page of notes. Yeah, that's looking really good. And yeah, having that value kind of up there at the, the top really lends it to to feeling more rounded all the way around. I think like it can start to feel like a tunnel if you put the highlight too close to the edge. So that's looking really good. Yeah, there you go. Oh, that's a great example. Wow, that looks a little cleaner and crisper than my example so far. Very nice. Who is that? Doesn't say iPhone 9. <laughs> oh, there's another great example. Brittany, thank you for sharing. Yeah, that's looking good. That's looking nice and rounded. I see that crescent shape. All right, yeah. That's looking good. June, thank you for sharing. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get back to, to mine. We've got 92 people here, so I'm like... <laughs> If everybody shared, we'd, it would take a, a long time. Thank you all for sharing so far. We can share again towards the end here. So yeah, I'm just kind of thinking about that curve all the way around. Like if yours is feeling like a tunnel, think about the curve that goes this direction, you know, get some shading going this direction with your pencil too, because that curve needs to wrap all the way around. And Here's kind of a silly little thing I came up with when I used to teach middle school, but um, I think some of y'all may find this helpful. So, you know, we talked about that C curve. There's another thing that kind of happens sometimes is like if you start out with a C curve, but then it turns into kind of a banana shape, <laughs> you know, because one side of the banana kind of feels a little like straighter right so like you might have like the starting of a c curve but then it gets kind of flat then what happens is other lines can start to feel flat too and then you know if we've got this circle like that has like a c curve on one side but then some of the value starts to feel kind of flat you know it starts to get confusing what we're looking at it might you know something like that could be happening. So make sure you're like really making all of those lines curve around. We want 
We want it to feel rounded on all, all sides. So the more we round it out, the more like that little flat banana disappears and the more it starts to feel, you know, nice and, and round all the way around. So, <clears throat> okay. I feel like I slowed down so much that now some of y'all are getting ahead of me, but that is totally fine with me. I can always jump to my other example to move us along. Plus, this was all we intended for, for the class, and we're still way ahead of schedule here. So, But then I thought we would squeeze in a couple of other shading techniques. Um, okay, let's see. I'm not going to do the stippling technique because that one takes too long. Let's do crosshatching and scribbling because those are the two that go the fastest. And those will also help with the contour lines if you're struggling with, you know, making it feel more spherical. So I definitely have that spherical shape coming across in mine now. And I think, you know, going thinking about like the curve in the other direction really helped. Also, I think it helps to get some value coming up the other side right here. That way it doesn't feel like, you know, a tunnel. <laughs> I know it's really easy to make this drawing feel like a tunnel. Tunnel of light. Okay. Yeah, you can get pretty far with just a few pencils. I feel like I really only used three or four pencils here. I did not use them all. Okay, let's do this again with um, the cross hatching technique because we're going to be able to go in multiple directional lines here, and that's going to really help with the contours. So, and if you want to keep working on your your tonal shading sphere, by all means, keep going. I just feel like I might as well with this extra time in the class. And this allows me to cover the one thing that I kind of left out of this, which was the contour line, since we already had that contour line review with the limes uh, recently. I included four different photos of a lime facing all different directions. And we spent an entire class, one hour, putting just the contour lines on. And then we spent another hour putting the value on using uh, these four shading techniques that I reviewed using the pen and ink. So it was a two-part class, but I had it broken up in a way that the classes could stand alone on contour lines and then um, the pen and ink value shading techniques. Okay, so we've got our little sun over here, and then we've got our cast shadow. Okay, so I'll start with, I don't know where my 9B disappeared to, but my 8B keeps being the darkest one. Oh, there it is. Okay, I got my 9B. All right, so with the 9B, or whatever your darkest pencil is, we're going to start to put these cross-hatching lines. So we'll start with our little crescent moon C-curve. And I'm just going to let up on my pressure for the, the lighter value here. So I've got, let's do a few different lines. So these are like all of the, the contours are like the elevational curves of a form and they follow whatever the elevation of the form is doing. So it's all of the edges of a form and that class on contour lines using the limes is very helpful if you, you know, if I, I'm not explaining it properly enough here really quickly. All right, and then going in the other direction, we've also got a curve, right? So we really want this like wraparound curve thing. It, we want it to feel spherical on all sides. And since we can use multiple directional lines, we can have them coming 
from all different angles. So on a sphere, no matter which direction I come at it from, it's always going to be a curved line. So I think crosshatching is really helpful to understand how to turn a you know flat thing into a three-dimensional thing because you can you know just get those elevational lines going any which way and they're all going to be curved and so eventually I mean automatically that's starting to feel nice and curved here so the more we go over with these lines so I'm using kind of one line at a time but every line that I'm adding is curving it might start to feel pretty tonal and you could even let you know, some tonal shading come into it because there's no rules that say you can't have tonal shading and cross hatching in the same drawing. Um, I've got a weird bulge happening over here. Let me try to even that out. Okay, so this is only with the 9B so far. Let me switch to a, I'm just going to jump to a 3B here and start to put some of my mid tone value in. And I'm still following that curve. No matter what I do, it's a curved line. So even if the banana thing starts to happen here, like I feel like a few of my lines are kind of doing that banana thing, it's okay. It's really easy to camouflage them with the, the cross hatching. So as long as like 70% of what's visible is a curved line, we're going to read it as a sphere when we're done here. And then let's think about that little pimento in the olive. And then get our lighter values. And yeah, we can just keep that C curve going up here. You could kind of radiate out. I feel like cross hatching, I don't know, my brain just really functions better with the the kind of diagram that you can get with this and I like to just like almost like a spider web covering the whole thing you know radiate out from the center and like curve it in all different directions because the sphere is curved in all the ways it's curved So like I said, if you get some accidental flat lines in there, just start curving them on top of the flat lines and it'll eventually start to feel spherical. And then you can you know, go back and forth between your B pencils and your H pencils so that you get this blend to start to happen with the cross hatching, or you can put some tonal shading in there if you're impatient doing it with the cross hatching. And then now that I've gotten this far, now it's like really easy to get my lines to curve. Like whatever my brain was doing when I was accidentally putting flat lines in there has disappeared. Like I can see that spherical shape and it's really easy to keep it feeling rounded on all the, in all the directions. <clears throat> So it really helps to like go in some different, you know, directions across it, not just, you know, the vertical or the horizontal axis, but do both, you know, or maybe get like a diagonal version of that curve in there somehow as well. 
just whatever direction you have to go to get it to start to feel like it's rounded on all the sides. <clears throat> all right, and then I forgot about my cast shadow here. We want these to be straight lines. So we can go back across. And make them cross hatched as well. Okay, so there's our sphere using, excuse me. Um, using cross hatching. All right, and we'll do one more with scribbling. This is my favorite one and it goes so fast compared to the other shading techniques. So I'm just starting with my, my 8B this time. The other wonderful thing about these one and a half hour long classes is that we're getting a lot of our daily drawing practice in. If you're supposed to do, you know, 20 minutes a day to like improve your drawing skills, doing an hour and a half like this, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but I just drew that circle a lot easier and a lot faster than the first time I drew a, a circle an hour ago. So just this hour long of drawing is improving my circle drawing skills, making it happen a little faster. Okay, so we're still following that C curve, but we're using the scribble technique. And we're just scribbling. And I think this is the easiest one because you can just really you don't have to worry about that banana thing happening as much because it's easier to like curve a a, a scribble a scribble. What am I trying to say? Oh, thank you, Kelly. Well, it comes with practice, you know, lots of practice. Okay, so I'm just scribbling around but still trying to follow that C shape, that crescent moon shape to start here. And then I'm kind of letting up on my pressure. Maybe I'll go ahead and do my cast shadow too. So same thing with this one. It can start to feel a little tonal. In fact, when I'm doing tonal shading, I'm actually scribbling. <laughs> I'm just doing it in a little less obvious way. I'm letting it be like soft and gradual, but I'm like over here on this tonal shading one, I was still scribbling. I was just doing it so soft that it comes across blended the whole time. But scribbling is my jam. So I think it's really easy to kind of use the scribble technique in a soft way to get the, the tonal value to come across. So it's kind of interchangeable for me. It's really easy to like kind of go back to the side of the pencil and start to get the tonal thing to happen again. Even though, you know, I started out with more of like the tip of the pencil and scribbling. So you can always combine these. That's the question that gets asked the most in that, like in that class about those four value shading techniques. Can you combine them? And I always like to joke, of course, there's no drawing police. Nobody's gonna, you know, knock on your door because you combined hatching with scribbling or stippling with tonal shading, you know, do whatever feels right to you. But so yeah, my scribbling technique often turns into tonal shading or vice versa. 
And then, yeah, we're getting the H pencils in there for those lighter values and thinking about that curve. You know, think about what we just did with the cross hatching. Try to get that same thing to happen, but with the scribble technique where it's like following that elevational curve all the way. And if it helps to even like put those hatching lines in there then put them in there and then just scribble over them. Those of you who've been with me for so many of these classes know that I kind of put those contour lines on every drawing. It is so helpful to see that, that diagram for me. And yeah, if the tunnel thing is starting to happen, because like I kind of see it on my drawing a little bit right now. And it's like, okay, well, that just tells me I need to pay attention to that like other axis. So if I'm kind of focusing on the, the latitude, then I want to focus on the longitude of this sphere to try to get away from it feeling, you know, less three-dimensional and more I mean a tunnel is three-dimensional it's just inverted right so it's like that means that your other axis is somehow dipping instead of curving over so like try to think about the globe not a hole in the ground not a well a globe, not a well. Because, yeah, even when I just kind of did that, like curved it over in that other way, wow, that got really dark because I was putting all those other lines in there. If yours gets too dark, too, you can always just take your eraser and erase out kind of a, you know, crescent shape in the middle there and then go back and be a little more gradual in your shift from light to dark. <clears throat> All right, I think that's a pretty good place to stop. Although now I just, now I want to fix that. I just messed up there. We get a couple more minutes for me to fix this. And then I want to see all of y'all's latest spheres that you've done. All right. Do you all want to hold up your sketches and let me see some of your crosshatched and scribbled spheres that you made? Ooh, I see. I guess that's iPhone 9. I don't know your name, but those are gorgeous popping out. Brittany, I can see. Okay, sorry, who we have spotlighted here. Barbara, lovely Barbara. I got distracted looking at some of the other folks that were holding them up. Yeah, those are really nice. Yeah, that scribble and the cross hatching, it's, it's really feeling nice and rounded. Maybe think about that, like, you know, the other like longitudinal lines on that, uh, the scribbled one to try to get it to feel more curved, like over the top of the, the sphere. Oh, <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Nice to see I'm not the only one struggling with blurry problems tonight. <laughs> Lori in Chicago. I think that's your, um, yeah, your blurred background is. Oh, look at that. Those are lovely, Brittany. Yeah. Really gorgeous work. Very convincing spheres. Love it. Oh, there we go, Lori. Very nice. Yeah, those look great. Oh, they almost look like water droplets. They're so soft and spherical. Love it. Oh, my goodness. Who is this? W. That's all we have is W. Those are incredible. That looks amazing. Well, I could have just sat back and drank my tea and let W teach the class. Wow. <laughs> I see somebody giving you some applause. That was gorgeous. Those are great. Um, okay, let's see. I saw them for a second and now I'm seeing your ceiling fan, Emily. Okay, we'll come back to you. Um, let's see. Oh my goodness. Oh, I just love a good page of notes. If you want to post that online and tag me, I'd love it or share it with me. I just love seeing all my teaching come across in a full page of notes like that. And your sketches are beautiful. I like that you got that whole value scale. I love that you did it all on the same page too. It's just, uh, two pages. It looks so great. Yeah, that's just great, just lovely. All right, we got another lovely page of notes there. And yeah, those spheres are looking very spherical. Beautiful work. Crystal, thank you for sharing. Oh, here we are back to Emily. Very nice. Yeah, that looks great. I love how stylized all of all of these are. I, I just love that with all of these examples, how and in all of these classes, whatever we do, people always put their own style into things. Yeah, and look how you went from like one of those, um, how the like the the rounded form really evolved there in your sketches. And yeah, I really liked having more time to delve deeper into that. I'm glad we had the extra time to go a little farther with the, the shading techniques than I had planned. So it was good we rushed through the beginning. Ooh, look at those. Those are so nice and soft and round. Beautiful, Angel. Well, we are almost at the end of the hour here. We got one minute left. Oh, look at this those. This is the last one. Okay. We didn't get to spotlight iPhone 9. <laughs> Did they leave? Um, Because it won't come across on the recording if we don't spotlight them. This is so lovely. Zoom user. Beautiful. Those are great examples. Oh, I see. They're holding it up again. Do you see them? iPhone 9? Yeah, I can, I can um spotlight them after. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, this is great. I love this page of notes as well. Sorry, I didn't mean to zip past, zip past you. Um, iPhone 9, do you want to hold up your your notes again? Adrian would like to spotlight them. Yeah, I want to get you on the Zoom recording because we can only see you. There we go. Yeah, look at that. So just the contrast on that from a distance was just popping across the interweb at me. Beautiful. And your handwriting is lovely too. Those are just gorgeous examples. Thank you so much for sharing. All right, y'all. Thank you so much. I'm excited about this longer format. So yeah, we'll um, get into implied line next time. I'm really excited about that one because I just love that drawing exercise. Um, so, and I provided the reference photos for you. So I'll see you next Wednesday for that one. And thank you, Chanel, our wonderful moderator. Y'all have a great evening. See you next time.